So welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance and we continue in our session on the Monte Carlo method. So we already have a, maybe a very nice uh, intuition for the Monte Carlo method and maybe the most important result was here our Monte Carlo convergence rate. So we have a sequence of IID random variables here real valued and we would like to approximate the expectation yeah expectation of x1 yeah they are all, all the same distribution so we would like to approximate that guy by this uh, running sum so we approximate the space average by the time average and uh, we have this nice result that the probability that we lie outside a region of say a given epsilon is smaller than well sigma squared divided by epsilon squared divided by n so if we make n larger we can make this probability really small or maybe a bit nicer for us if we prescribe a given probability uh, a large probability so one minus delta so delta is now the amount the probability that we miss the result by a certain number so if we prescribe uh, this probability then we can say we lie within a certain error bound with this uh, probability so the difference of our approximation and the expectation is with this given probability smaller than sigma divided by square root of this delta divided by square root of n. And you see we have a convergence order one divided by square root of n. Uh, a bit disappointing, this holds uh, in probability. So it could be that on some omegas, if you take an omega, we miss this. Yeah, and from that, we could now uh, derive a nice application, very simple. We looked at integration, so Monte Carlo integration. And it was just based on this little lemma. So if we apply a function to IID random variables, then the image, so the function values are also IID random variables. So this means if we take a special case of uniform distributed ones, yeah, where the density is just one, uh, expectation is just the integral f of x dx, then this corresponds to approximating an integral. I already then gave you the definition of our Monte Carlo integral with this uh, little derivation, but before we looked closer to the Monte Carlo integral, so we will give the definition again uh, um, today, uh, we looked at a classical integration rule. And the reason that I did this was to illustrate the difference between Monte Carlo integration and classical integration. And today I would like to explore this a little bit more with you. Also, we will implement both methods and you will also see a big difference it's the sheer simplicity of the Monte Carlo integration that is so nice. And an example for classical integration, well, you know, a, a Riemann sum, yeah, you can just take uh, equi uh, distant points and then you can just make a Riemann sum as an approximation. Another nice example is here the Simpsons rule. So we have the Simpsons rule if you take three points. So we hate here the left end point, the right end point, and the center point, then choosing the coefficients in a clever way gave us a very nice error estimate here, an error estimate that has length of the interval to the power of five. And if we now concatenate these integration rules in this picture here, if this here is the A and this here is the B, then if we concatenate these integration rules, well, we have one here, four here, one here, but then the next rule will also have a one here, a four here, a one here. So it's alternating four, two, four, 
two with the coefficients. So if we then go to the case where we have multiple points and now I relabel the A and B. So now my A is here, the starting point of this discretization and the B is here, the end point of the discretization. So I call the inner point now x0, x1, x2, so xi. Then we have the nice integration rule, integrate a function from A to B can be approximated by the two endpoints are maybe special, the left endpoint, the right endpoint, and then it's alternating. The previous center point is taking with the coefficient of four, and the endpoints of two intervals that after this concatenation come together, then get a coefficient of two. So we have this nice little scheme yeah, of performing function evaluations. You see, I have to take an odd number of points. Um, if you then, use this error estimate. Here you have length of the interval to the power of five. So we have something like length of the interval to the power of five summed over the whole interval. So that means um, I get a length of the smaller interval to the power of four multiplied with the length of the interval summed over all uh, intervals, the total interval. So if we do the concatenation of this integration rule, we have this nice error estimate. So we have here that the error goes with an h to the power of four. And now if the h is the equidistant partitioning of your interval, so it is the whole interval from A to B divided by M, the number of intervals. Then uh, we see that we go with one divided by M to the power of four. So this is an exponent eight better than our Monte Carlo convergence rate. Yeah? The Monte Carlo convergence rate was one divided by square root of N number of function evaluations. And here it is one divided by, by m to the power of four. So m is not the function evaluations. The number of function evaluations is actually uh, m plus one. We have m intervals and m plus one function evaluations because we also have the other endpoint. But OK, that doesn't matter. So you see the classical integration rule. Uh, has a much higher um, uh, higher convergence rate. So uh, yeah, it looks really better, but it also looks more complicated. Yeah? I mean, I cannot just take the points randomly. I have to use um, a special structure. And what we see uh, later is that actually the lack of the structure, so that Monte Carlo doesn't have the structure, this is here a disadvantage because it is the structure that gives us this high rate because there is cancellation in the Taylor, Taylor uh, expansion. But the lack of the structure is actually a feature. It's not a bug, it's a feature. And it's a special feature that will lead to a very strong property, namely that the rule is independent of the dimension in higher dimensions. So uh, we will come to the code later, but this here is my code for the Simpsons rule. And I already discussed the move to higher dimensions. So let's all also shortly recall that. So if you like to move to higher dimensions, what you do, for example, if you move to two dimensions, what you do is you perform the integration rule in one dimension, keeping the other dimension fixed. So you calculate the integral along, say, x1 for a fixed x2. 
Then you do this for a discretization of the X2 for different values of X2. And then you integrate these results. So you integrate these values here, again with the same integration rule. And if you then ask yourself, okay, how many function evaluations do I have? So we, we count the uh, computational effort in terms of uh, function evaluation. Then you see that you have uh, N functions either evaluation in X1 per X2. Uh, so you have to the power of D, function evaluations. So it will be here an M plus one to the power of D if the M plus one is the, the number of function evaluations along one dimensions, along one dimension. So you see that uh, we have a special structure. Yeah, we build a Cartesian product of integration rules, uh, and this will then give us an exponential growth in the dimension. Yeah, well, if you now look at this part here, you see that it is n, the total number of function evaluations to the power of minus four divided by D yeah, uh, is our convergence rate. Because the error that we have just remains the same. Yeah? I mean, just consider that the function does not depend on X2. So then you have here always an error that is one divided by H to the power of four. Uh, so you will get one divided by h to the power of four as the error part. So that means if you move to higher dimension, the size here stays the same, but you need more points. So if you express the error bound in terms of the total number of function evaluations, so my n is now the total number of function evaluations. So this is the m plus one to the power of d then you see that I get um, a decreasing order as the dimension increase. So for D equal to eight, this is one divided by square root of N, like for Monte Carlo. So as the dimension becomes higher, this is the same as, uh, for the Monte Carlo integral. Let's look at the Monte Carlo integral. And I have mentioned it, but we haven't seen that how the Monte Carlo integral behaves in higher dimensions. Because when I motivated it, it was just for a function uh, on R, so just for a function in one dimension. And really, this is now a, a, a bit nice to see this. So let's first redefine our Monte Carlo integral. So we now look at the function on zero one to the power of D. So a D dimensional cube. Okay, so it maps to R, the real value. And then of course, I have to consider a D dimensional vector valued sequence of IID random variables. They should have uniform distribution on zero one. And then I just perform the function evaluation on each of these vectors. So actually this is now here a vector and we perform the function evaluation on each of these guys. N function evaluations, so we just have N here, we divide by N. So we perform the sum over these N function evaluations and divide by N. And we call that the Monte Carlo approximation of the integral over this unit cube F of X dx. We will come to code later, but 
this would be a code that implements this. And you already see that it's much shorter, huh? much more simple. So now on the suitable assumption, we have that we get a convergence and it's again, the Chepichev inequality that provides us our error estimate, but now for the function from one to zero to the power of D from the D dimensional unit cube. So let F be well, continuous L2, so square integrable. Yeah, so I have the variance, I have the expectation uh, of uh, F of X and um, XI is here my sequence of IID random variables. So then here my Monte Carlo integral converges to the, the true solution. So integral f of x dx over this d dimensional unit cube in the following probabilistic sense. So the difference of the two is larger than sigma divided by square root of delta divided by square root of n only with a probability that is smaller than delta. So maybe maybe a bit a bit nicer for us that we use here smaller and then you can here have um, a larger or equal one minus delta. Okay, so and you see that we have a convergence rate that is one divided by square root of n. Sigma is again the parameter describing a bit how volatile F is. So for example, look at the special case that F is a constant. Yeah? So if F is a constant, F of a random variable is a constant and it has no variance. Uh, then this integral here, integrating F over the unit cube is just this constant. It's just a constant and the volume of this cube is one. Well, and then actually one point is uh, sufficient. Yeah? So even with n equals to one, I get exactly the right value of the integral. So you see that the variance of the function plays a role. Yeah? The variance of the function en enters here into the equation. It makes uh, the, thing, the thing worse. That's our result. And the really striking important thing is that I just assumed here a function in D dimension, but there is no dimension occurring in this estimate. So the error estimate doesn't care about the dimension. Okay, and that's, that's a surprise and uh, Hopefully we get some, some more intuition on this. This is generated by this lack of structure. And to some extent, it's due to the fact that we have a probabilistic error estimate. Later, we can remove the probabilistic nature and we can, a point -wise can uh, get a point-wise uh, estimate, but you see later that this also relies on the fact that the sequence doesn't have so much structure. So this is the important thing here. So note that we now consider the general case of a D-dimensional integral. Yeah? So we have here the function on zero one D and most importantly, note that the parameter D does not appear in our error estimate. So there is no parameter D here. Yeah, how is this achieved? Uh, maybe I have to prove this. The proof is, well, say trivial. The thing is that our little lemma that allows us to move to uh, from our Monte Carlo approximation to the Monte Carlo integral, it also holds for functions on RD. So the thing is, if F is a function 
from RD to R. And I have a sequence of IID random variables, now vector valued. Then the function values, so set i being fi of xi, are also IID. And then I apply theorem 18, our error estimate, with set i in place of xi. So let's go to the theorem. Where, where was that? Okay, so it's just this guy that I mentioned in the beginning. And well, you see here, I assume real valued random variables. Yeah, but if I now go back, the set i, the function values are real valued. The point is that I apply this error estimate in the image space. So he actually doesn't care about the arguments. It's just that I create these values. So here is um, a, a, a small uh, summary. Yeah. So the thing is that the set i is still a real valued random variable in R and he doesn't know about the dimension. So this explains why the dimension does not appear uh, in the error estimate. So we still apply our convergence result on this real valued random variable. So how is now the procedure? So what we do is, if xi is a sequence of iid random variables in R, so before in the theorem it was uh, in Rd, but now I relabel a little bit the names because xi is now in R, and then I generate the yk in Rd by using our little trick to fill each component with an element from the sequence x. So yk, the j component is x k minus one times the dimension plus j. So we move through every component and we create the vector. So this is how you take a one dimensional sequence and generate a d dimensional sequence. And the next step is then that I have the d dimensional sequence, which I use in the integration and I apply my function. So I generate zk of f of yk. So you see that there are three sequences of iid random variables involved. There is the sequence x of iid random variables in R. From that, I build the sequence y of iid random variables now in R to the power of d. And from that, I build the sequence of the function evaluations on which I have my convergence result. And now remember how IID sequences are modeled. So you move to the product space. Maybe I go back to the slide, one second. So we had this little slide yeah, where I just recalled what is a drawing yeah, and how do we model drawing as sequences of IID random variables. And in order to model, a random variable that is identically distributed, I need to introduce a larger space. And you already see that I move here to a higher dimensional space. I move here to the product space in order to create this sequence of IID random variables. Then we had this other remark that we create from a one-dimensional sequence, a d-dimensional sequence by filling the components. So if we now go back here to our Monte Carlo integration, you see that IID sequences are already sequences which have in the background a high dimensional space and having now a sequence of a d-dimensional vector well, it's maybe just the same product space that lies behind it as having D elements of the one-dimensional sequence. 
So for him, there is no difference. So you see, the whole generation of the sequence scales linear in the dimension. Yeah, why? Because I just need this, this strategy of taking a one-dimensional sequence and fill the vector. So that's the only thing where the dimension comes in, and it's only a step where it scales linear. And now you understand very nicely why we do not have the dimension here popping up, yeah? because it is just take d times one-dimensional sequence to fill up the component behind. So big, big, uh, big difference, yeah? So only a single small spot where the dimension enters and the spot, it only enters in a linear case, yeah? You have to do d times more, yeah? With the Simpsons rule or with the classical integration rule, it scales exponentially. So you can also reformulate the um, error estimate for the integral uh, in an L2 norm sense, yeah, but that's not so useful for us. Yeah, so maybe we can skip that. And um, here you find a nice experiment. Maybe you can do that later uh, where um, you can approximate actually very nicely uh, P by a two dimensional integral and then perform Monte Carlo integral. So approximate P by this uh, Monte Carlo um, experiment. Yeah? So where you just count if a point, a random point lies inside uh, the circle or outside the circle. That's the corresponding code. And maybe you can do that later. So now we have seen two integration methods, a classical one, the Simpsons rule, very fast convergence, at least in one dimension or in lower dimension, a little bit more complicated and the Monte Carlo integration. And I would like to do a small code session with you to implement both methods. So we can see maybe also the difference in the convergence, but we also can see the difference in simplicity to, to implement these guys. And um, in the implementation, I would like to do it with Java streams. Maybe that's a nice one if you would like to do a small um, experiment. So we get a short introduction here into working with streams. Streams are quite helpful if you have data and you would like to apply small transformation uh, to the data. But maybe I do not like streams for doing big, big uh, for solving big problems. Yeah? Uh, they are, they can be, they can be uh, in a small area. They can play a very important role, but uh, the code should not be too involved. Yeah, the transformations, then it's maybe not so so clear what's going on. Uh, and also, they sometimes are a little bit more difficult if you consider multi-threaded applications, which is an advantage for the Monte Carlo integration. But here for our little code session, streams are a very nice tool. And so let's have a small excursion in working with Java streams. So this stream is just what we need to create our uh, integral. So it is a possibly unbounded sequence of objects or of primitive data types. So integer or doubles. So that's actually exactly what we would consider in our Monte Carlo integral. So in our Monte Carlo integral, we are looking actually at the sum I, and now I'm the programmer, so I count from zero, I from zero to N minus one. Okay, I would like to do integration. So I have an F of, and then I have an F of XI. Well, the XI is here my IID random variable, right? So, that object f of xi is a random variable and that sum is a random variable. So if I would like to calculate a value, I have to evaluate 
the random variable. So this guy here is now my little xi. So I take this sequence and plug it in here. So these streams are maybe the object that I can use here in my integration rule. For the primitives, say for example, the floating point doubles, which we like to use here, there is um, a special stream called a double stream. And a double stream can be generated from a double supplier. Okay, so what is a double supplier? A double supplier is just an interface that describes, okay, this object can supply you with the next value. So it is like the xi, so give me the next value, but then increase the i. Okay, so give me the next value and increase the counter such that when I call you again, uh, give me the value that is following that value. So here you have the definition of the double supplier. So it is an interface and it just has a function. Give me the next value. Okay, so I can get a sequence of number uh, from, for example, such um, a double supplier, yeah, which generates this stream. And, but now the stream can also perform operations on the sequence. So we can apply a function, map a function to the stream, and it will create a new stream. So I can, for example, apply the function f that we have here, and we can create a new stream of values zi. So zi are now the function evaluations applied to xi. So you can just write, take the stream, so the sequence of the x values, and apply the function f, so map the function f to get the stream of the values set. And he will do this in the background for us. And then as the next step, we can perform some terminal operations that take the whole stream and calculate something like, for example, a sum. So we can take and say, calculate the sum. So it looks a little bit as if the streams are, well, very, very suitable for our um, application. Well, let's illustrate a little bit this working with streams. So let's create a new uh, class here. So how do I call this? Let's call it Java Streams Experiments. And I just illustrate you a little bit. Wow, that's a typo here. Uh, I just illustrate a little bit how these guys work. Okay, so this is about working, working with streams. Yeah, you can create streams of this different objects and some streams of primitive values have then a special name for, for example, a stream of integers. Uh, and you can create it, for example, with here the function range. And you see it has two argument, the start value and the end value. The start value is inclusive, the end value is exclusive. Yeah, so if we would like to have something from uh, zero to n minus one, n being say, for example, here, the 10, uh, then I would like uh, write uh, this. So this would be the stream zero, one, two, three, and then up to nine. Yeah. So the end is not uh, included. So, so what can you then do with this? Okay, uh, if you just 
look what you can do. Well, you can, for example, count the number of elements. You can also take uh, the sum of the elements. You can, can take the maximum, the minimum. Yeah, so here's the sum. Uh, you also have some for each. Yeah, here, by the way, is the map. Yeah, you can apply a map to it, a transformation. Uh, and I also have uh, for each. And the for each takes here some consumer. So the consumer is uh, something that consumes an element, a function that does something. Uh, for example, I can consume the element i and just print the value. Okay, so let's run this little program here. Okay, and you see he just prints the stream. Uh, there's one special thing about the stream. So the stream is representing our sequence of values. Uh, and you see he's going through the sequence one by the other and applying this. Uh, let's maybe just do this again here. Let's repeat this and print it again. Okay, so we get an error and he tells us the stream has already been operated or upon or closed. So he went through the whole stream and then he is finished. So we can consume each element only once and we cannot reuse the stream. For our application, this is quite okay, but you have to be aware, aware of this. Yeah? Of course, it doesn't mean that you are not allowed to do some operation on the, st on, on the stream uh, multiple times. Some operations can be performed. For example, there is here the operation skip, yeah? and I can skip four elements but I get for the skip here, the same error. And if we look here, you see that actually it is creating a stream consisting of the remaining elements. So actually what I have to do is I have to either create here a new variable And then I can operate on that one. Okay, and you see that he has skipped the first four elements, zero to three. Or you could, if you do not like that, you could just write and assign this to your previous variable, but it's a new object. So you have to be a bit careful in reusing the stream. And actually most applications of the stream are where you take the stream, you make some transformations and then you do a terminal operation like calculate the sum. Okay, so we saw here that we can also transform a stream so we can apply a function to it map. So now here I have a stream of integers. Uh, so I can also apply a function to this. So I can take indices dot map and you see there are different functions. There is here a function that maps integers to integers an int unitary operator, but there are also functions that map integers to double an int to double function. Can also create an object, a map to an object. So maybe let's create a stream of floating point double values. So that's a double stream. So let's take our indices and apply a function that maps now an integer, so our i, to a floating point double number. So maybe I would like to create out of these indices an equi distant partitioning of the real axis here. And let's now print this stream of values. So I do for each and I just print this out. So just print each element. So let's run this and you see 
I have here a zero. So I have 10 times zero plus five, which gives me the five. And then it's increasing in steps of 10. Huh? So this may be also nice and useful for us if we like to create some partitioning, for example, for our Simpsons uh, integration. So maybe I print a small separator. Uh, we have um, a next experiment. Here I generated the stream using this provided function range, but I told you that I can also generate a stream with any interface implementation of the supplier. So and a nice supplier is a random number generator. So let's create a stream of random numbers. Well, maybe first we start with random numbers. So there is a double supplier, which is a random number generator. Okay, so now I will discuss random numbers later in another part of the lectures, also a very nice and interesting topic, but now just take it as a black box. There is a random number generator called Mersenne Twister, and we can, we can just uh, use it here. So I have this Mersenne Twister here in this library. And if you go to the implementation of the Mersenne Twister, so we can have a look to it. So you see that it implements the one dimensional random generator interface. And this is just a double supplier. So it just has a method that provides you with the next number. So actually the double supplier had the function get as double, but you see he just returns then the next floating point number. So he's implementing just this interface here. Okay, so we have a random number generator that implements this interface. And then you can create a stream out of this. So let's create this. So we have the stream random numbers that is just use the function generate with the given supplier. So I just use this supplier to generate a stream. And maybe I just print now this stream. Yeah, okay, I cannot print the stream. I would like to print every element. So let's do random numbers for each. And then for each element, print the element. So by the way, uh, the thing that is inside the for each is a double consumer. Yeah? So instead of a function that has no argument and returning, so it has no argument and returning a double value, it is, the consumer is a function that has no return value. So it just does something, but it has a double argument, okay? So if you go to the for each, you see it takes this double consumer. And if you go into the definition of this interface, you see it is just a function that takes a value, but it has no return value. Yeah? It just does something. And the map is then the guy that takes an argument and returns a new value. So the, the um, argument of the map is then a guy that takes uh, a value and returns a new value. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's do that. Okay, so we print here this uh, sequence. Okay, and this now runs on forever.
because what I had here on my slide is that the stream may be bounded or unbounded. So it's possibly unbounded. So what we had on the top was a, an example of a bounded stream. And what we have now here is an unbounded stream. You can make the stream bounded. There is a function. So if you would like to bound it to say 10 random numbers. Yeah? So now I have a stream of 10 here. Then I can just apply the function limit here and bound it to that many numbers. So the stream will end at after 10 numbers. So let's run that now. Okay, so you have this. And then there are also so-called terminal operations. A terminal operation is, for example, the sum that will take the whole stream, consume it, and return maybe some value, like, for example, the sum. So I can now take the random numbers and calculate the sum. So, and maybe I now print the sum. Okay, and you know, maybe I'm not allowed to do this anymore because the stream is consumed. Yeah? So, but if I run that, I will get an error here. Yeah, you see this line here? stream has already been operated it is consumed so let's remove this here so so what's the sum the sum is here a 5.9 uh, maybe last remark yeah to finish this little introduction into streams we will then implement our monte carlo integrals with the streams um, if i run this here again and again you will see that the sum is changing yeah, because it is a random sequence and he will always generate actually a new random sequence. This generate a new random sequence. Yeah? So by the way, it's five, it's 10 values divided by 10, it's 0 0.5. The average is approximately 0 0.5. Yeah? Uh, you can provide here some seed yeah, to the random number generator, which will always generate the same sequence. Yeah? The seed is something like the starting value, if you would like the initial value. We will come to this later. So now he's always generating here the same sequence. So it's always the same sum. If you have uh, a different seed, you will get always the same different number. Okay. So that was a small intro into working with streams and I will use, I will use them. So let's have a code session and implement Monte Carlo integration in one dimension. Okay, so we almost had Monte Carlo integration on the previous session for the streams. Uh, there was only a few things missing. Yeah, Apply the function f and divide by the number of values, yeah? more or less. Um, before I will do Monte Carlo integration, let us do the Simpsons rule because it's much more complicated. Yeah? And then maybe implementing the Monte Carlo is a little bit like a relief to us because it is so nice. So I will do both. Yeah? Let's do a Monte Carlo integrator and let's also do a Simpsons rule integrator. And I would like to make it now a little bit cleaner. Yeah? So here in this code session, I always do short experiments, sometimes with, with a lot of code duplication. Let's make it a little bit cleaner and implement both methods by implementing an interface, the interface of an integrator. So my integrator is a function that returns the integral so this return value here is the integral a to b 
f of x dx. When I supply as the arguments df, so the f is an operator that maps a floating point double to a floating point double. So a double unary, yeah, one argument operator. And I have to supply, of course, the bounds. So these are my A and B. And I will now construct two such in integrators or implement two such integrators, one using Monte Carlo and one using uh, the Simpsons rule. And they should both implement this interface. So let's start first by defining our interface. So our interface is called, uh, how is it called? Integrator 1D. So our interface is called Integrator 1D. An integrator for one dimensional functions of one argument, one dimensional functions. Okay. And it just has a single method namely integrate. An argument is the double unary operator, so function, this is the integrand, and the lower bound and the upper bound. So this is now the interface I would like to implement and let's create a new class implementing this interface. So my first class is the Simpsons integrator. So let's call the Simpsons integrator 1D and it should implement this interface. So I can add this here you know, in this small lizard because then he will al already generate some code for us. He will add that this class implements this interface and he will also add a stop implementation for the method we have to implement. Okay, so my Simpsons integrator, let's go back to the slides. Well, I need to know the function, this is, argument of my integrate function. The boundaries A, B, this is also the argument of my integrate function. But I also need to know the number of evaluation points. So my class has to have a constructor that tells me the number of evaluation points I would like to use. So I can create different Simpsons rule integrators with different uh, with different number of evaluation points. So now let's generate a constructor that initializes this field. Uh, there's also a nice wizard that can generate this constructor for you. So I can construct struct now here the Simpsons integrator with a given number of evaluation points. Uh, well, the number of evaluation points has to be has to be odd, right? It is if you take out the special first interval, which has one four, it's always two evaluation points that have two four, two four, two four. Yeah? The two is the starting point of the interval. The four is the middle point of the interval. And the two is because it is also the end point of the previous interval. So if you go back to this rule, you see it's, this, it's the starting point and four times the center point. So if I take out the first special interval, it's always two, four, two, four. So you see, I always have an even number of these points plus the additional last point. So the number of 
function evaluations is odd. So maybe we have to ensure this here. Uh, so I'm maybe a bit, little bit brutal and I just throw an exception yeah, if the number is not odd. So how can I check if the number is odd? I take the remainder of the division by two. And if this is not equal to one, then I throw an exception. So I throw an exception, maybe an illegal argument is an exception. Okay, so now I, I know that the number is odd. Yeah? So actually I also check that it's not negative because it's an integer, but maybe we are a bit sloppy now. Uh, let's implement now the integration rule. So the first thing I need is, well, in my um, integration rule, I go from A to B, I need the interval lengths, so that's the range. So let's define that. So we go from lower bound to upper bound. So the whole range is upper bound minus lower bound. Okay. Then how many intervals do we have? Well, we have number of double sized interval. This is the number of evaluation points minus one. This is the number of intervals. That is actually this interval here. But then you see when I would like to apply the rule, it's maybe nice to always consider two such intervals yeah, because then I have here the two, four, the two, four, and so on. So maybe I would like to group these guys into these groups. So take here the first guy and the four and consider that interval, and then consider the two and the four and consider that interval, consider the two and the four and consider that interval and so on. So that guy here is the next one in my graph here. And then I have another special guy, the last value. So how many such double sized intervals do I have? Okay. Take out the last value and divide by two. So this is the number of intervals I have, and then I divide by two. Yeah, so I know this is this number is even, then I can divide by two. So this is now the number of these double sized um, intervals. What is the length of this interval? So this is my interval size. So this is the range divided by number of double sized intervals, but now these always contain two intervals. So divided by two. Huh? So this would be the H in our little formula. Huh? So this is actually such a distance here. So this is now my interval size. So now let's create the integral. So first I create a stream of integral parts and then I sum it. So how do I create the streams? Yeah, let's create indices for my intervals. So this is an integer stream. So this is a little bit like we did before. So this is now my intervals. And this is an integer stream. 
and it ranges from zero to number of double-sized intervals. So these are now all these guys here, zero, one, two, yeah, and so on. And the last one is missing. Uh, since the first one is special too, maybe I would like to take out the first one too. So maybe I like to start in one. So these are just the inner intervals. Okay, so let's take the integral paths. So I take now the the inner intervals. So maybe I have to fix this typo here. So now I take the indices and calculate the via map to double that the index i maps to, okay, so what do we have? So I have now the points i, yeah? So i starts in one. Yeah? So two and three, this is two times i and two times i plus one. So I have two times i. Well, this is the index of the point. The point is multiplied with h, interval size. And this is the x of the odd indices point. And I have to evaluate the function. So it is the integrand evaluated at this point. Well, I have to start at lower bound. So it's lower bound plus two times i times interval size. So this guy here is actually the function evaluation f of x of two times i times h. Okay, so this guy comes with a coefficient of two. So it's the even points. So there's a odd. So it's the even points, the even indices. So it comes with a coefficient of two. It's this guy. So it comes with a coefficient of two. So there's a two times here in front. So then I would like to add the odd points. So now the odd points are four times evaluate the integrand at lower bound plus two times i plus one times interval size. Okay, and then I can close it. And this is the function that I would like to Uh, the bracket is here, there's a bracket too much, right? So, and this is the function I would like to uh, apply to the indices. So this function will converge the indices to the sum of the even and the odd. Uh, sorry, two times h plus one, two times i plus one the even and the odd points. If I now take the sum of all those guys, I have calculated actually these parts here, the blue ones. So two guys are missing, this special guy here and that guy. So let's just add these three function evaluations. Okay, so the total sum is now the sum of all the integral parts. So I can just take the stream of values and take the sum, but I need to add three special points. So it is the left endpoint. So it is
integrand evaluated at lower bound. It is the first middle point, which I have excluded. So this is lower bound plus interval size plus H. So the first point, that guy comes with a coefficient four. Okay, that's that guy. So I have now the one, the four, and the last interval point, the last point, the XM. So also at function evaluation at the upper bound. Okay, so, and now I can return the sum. So this is the sum, well, but you see that there is something in my rule. I have function evaluation times the length of the interval. And then because we have these special coefficients here, yeah, four, two, four, two, and the average of four and two is actually six divided by two is three. Yeah? So actually I'm counting every point three times yeah? uh, in a certain sense, I have to divide by the three. So I return H divided by three and I have to multiply with the interval size. So that, okay, that was, a bit complicated. That should be the Simpsons integrator rule. Let's try if this is correct. Wow. So let's create a small test and I will use now a unit test. So you can go here and select also new J unit test case. And he will create a class that is testing my implementation. Yeah? So you see he's also moving here to a different area, source test, yeah? and he should, this should now test my in implementation. So let's try and write a small test. So what do we would like to integrate? So let's take a lower bound from zero and an upper bound uh, is uh, 1.5. And maybe I would like to integrate uh, the cosine because that's a nice example. Right? I know the analytic uh, solution. So let's define my integrand. And my integrand is now X maps to the cosine of X. Well, that's a nice example because I know the analytic solution. I can tell you the analytic integral. So let's have the integral analytic. So that is X maps to the sign of X. Because if you differentiate the sign, you get the cosine. Um, then let's take number of evaluation points. to be say 101, yeah? So 100 of these um, intervals and define our integrator. So now I have my integrator. This is my Simpsons 1D integrator with that many evaluation points. Then I can calculate the integral value. So integral value, uh, numeric, this is the integrator. Integrate the integrand from lower bound to upper bound. So this is now nice here, it's just my interface. Yeah? Later, when we will check another integrator, I just have to change this line. Uh, it's just create another one. All the call here is the same. And of course, maybe as a benchmark, also calculate the analytic value. The analytic value is just the analytic integral evaluated at the upper bound minus the analytic value 
evaluated at the lower bound. So then I can just print the two. So maybe have a bit nice, uh, nicer output. So uh, let's let's create a nicer output. So let's create um, well some space where we print which integrator are we using. Yeah, actually, I know in this test I'm using the Simpsons, but uh, I can also ask here the integrator, what is your name? Because that means I can later use this code also for others and he will print nicely the name. And then maybe print the numeric value. So this is our integral numeric and also print the analytic value. Well, and maybe I would also print the error. So the difference of the two. So let's print the error. So let's calculate here the error. So it is the numeric value minus the analytic value. Oh, I hope I have done everything correct here. And this, this runs, yeah. Wow, that looks quite nice, okay. I just use 100 points and he's calculating the integral up to 10 to the minus four. So remember we have an h to the power of four as the convergence rate. Uh, it's an, it's, it's, sorry, he calculates here the error up to 10 to the minus 10. Uh, remember we have uh, an h to the power of four. Uh, so this here is 10 to the two number of points. So I would maybe expect like a 10 to the minus two times four, yeah? a 10 to the minus eight. It's even a bit better, maybe because the cosine is nicely and smooth, but it lies in the region that we would expect. Uh, if we just use 10 points, I cannot use 10 points, let's use 11. It's a 10 to the power of one, should go to the 10 to the power of minus four for the error estimate. And it's in the region, yeah? It's a 10 to the minus six. We are again, two digits better. You see the convergence rate is like we, like we have in the theorem. Okay, so let's now go back and implement our Monte Carlo integrator. So that is here our interface and let's create now the Monte Carlo integration. Okay, second part, Monte Carlo integration. Create a new class. I would like to implement my interface, my integrator interface. And I call the integrator now Monte Carlo integrator. Okay, again, I need as a parameter, the number of function evaluations. Okay. But for the Monte Carlo, I also need the random number generator, the double supplier that generates the sequence of random numbers. Random numbers will come in a different session of our lecture. Just take it as a black box that somebody provides me with this. So there is also here a private double supplier, which is my random number generator.
So let's create a constructor and somebody provides me with these guys, with these two arguments. Uh, and maybe if somebody does not want to provide a specific random number generator, maybe then I take a default one. So I can create another constructor that allows the construction without specifying the random number generator. And in that case, I would like to take a default one. Let's take the Mersenne twister, which I had in the other example with say some given seed. Okay, let's say, take um, some seed. So we will always get the same result. Uh, well, instead of writing this like this, you can also just call the other constructor, which is a little bit better style. So I call the other constructor and pass the default random number generator. And then I pass this argument. So now using this constructor, I can generate an integrator with a given number of evaluation points, and he will use the mere Zen twister as the random number generator. So let's integrate. So I need the range. So this is upper bound minus lower bound. And then I create the stream of random numbers. So that is my double stream of random numbers. Well, I just call now my double supplier. So let's generate the stream from the random number generator. And I limit it to the number of evaluation points. So this is now my stream of random numbers. And now I calculate the integral. The integral is just the sum of take the random numbers and apply the function evaluation so apply now the map that maps X to the integrant. Well, there is a small subtle thing. The random numbers are between zero and one. And my Monte Carlo integral is defined for integrals over the domain from zero to one. Here, I would like to integrate from lower bound to upper bound. So I just apply a transformation to the variable. This is just the rule of substitution that transforms the interval from A to B to zero and one. Okay, and this um, transformation, so if I have now the integral over the domain from zero to one, I have to transform inside the function to A to B. So it's just lower bound plus X, between zero and one times range. Okay, that's the evaluation of the integrand. And then I take the sum. Sorry, there's the apply missing. So then I take the sum. Yeah, and then that's my integral. Then I return the sum. Well, there are two parts missing. First, this is just the sum of the function evaluation. Monte Carlo integral is one divided by N. Yeah? So divide by the number of function evaluation. And then there's another part missing. I did the rule of substitution. So my X is between zero and one, but I apply this to the U, F of U, which is transformed. And you see the du by dx is equal to just range. So you see that du is equal to dx times range. So if I would like to calculate the integral over the x with the Monte Carlo, I have to multiply this here with range. So this range here just comes from the rule of the substitution. And now we are done. That's the Monte Carlo integral. And actually, it's just one line. Let's now create the test for this. So create a small J unit test. So I call it Monte Carlo integrator 1D test. Yeah, he already suggested. And the nice thing, I can just copy all the stuff which we did here. 
because it's just the same test. Actually, you should not do so much code doubling copying, uh, but for here, it's maybe okay. Uh, and I just do the same test and I replace here the integrator. So this is now my new Monte Carlo integrator 1D, say with 100 points uh, or with these number of evaluation points. So here I don't need to be odd, yeah? so I can just take 100 and I can just run now this little test. So let's run the test on the Monte Carlo. Okay, um, and you see um, it works, yeah. Uh, I have here the name, so he just picks the name of the class that I use. It's now the Monte Carlo guy. You see with the 100 points, we got a 10 to the minus 10 with an awesome 10 to the minus 10 uh, error. Here we just get um, well an 0 0.06. Yeah, if you round up, it's a 10 to the minus one. No? So we have a 10 to the minus two number of points and the error lies in the region of 10 to the minus, it's, it's actually one half 10 to the minus one. So you already see the square root here. Yeah? It's square root of 100 is 10. Yeah? So it's 10 to the minus one, one divided by 10. Let's instead of take 100, take 10,000. If I take 10,000, Okay, so you see, I gain another digit. Yeah? So 10,000 is 10 to the power of four. So it is 10 to the minus four half, yeah, square root. It's 10 to the minus two. Let's take 1 million. 10, oops. Oops, what's going on here? One, two, three, one, two, three, yeah, 10 to the six. It should be maybe a 10 to the minus three. Well, we are a little bit better, maybe because again, the cosine is quite smooth, yeah? We are a bit better, so the variance, yeah, is not so. Yeah, um, it's a 10 to the minus four. You see that the convergence result appears to be one divided by square root of n, it also pops up here. Yeah, so now with 100 million, it takes a bit time, yeah, but we are slowly converging. If you now compare this to the Simpsons rule, where with 100 points, we get a very accurate result, the method looks poor, but you saw today two advantages. One, actually in practice, it's so simple to implement. Yeah? I was actually done in a few minutes yeah? and I took three, three times the time for the Simpsons. And I had to think a lot about which points should I use. And the other one we saw in theory, the high dimension does not appear. And that is something I would like to teach you next session. And then we are done with the Monte Carlo and we move to random number generation. Uh, I will give you a short uh, review why Monte Carlo and this unstructured behavior is such a nice, nice um, advantage in high dimensions. So that was it for today. When we will have discussed random number generators, uh, we will introduce quasi random number generators, which are even a bit better. Uh, then we will return to this little integration toy here. And as an exercise, there's also an, will be an, a small assignment where you should implement integration in higher dimensions. That was it for today, thanks.